Well, uh, Shakespeare's famous play, Hamlet, you know the famous line from it. Prince Hamlet says this. He gets, says, to be or not to be, and I'll let you finish it. That is, that is the question. To be or not to be, that is the question. And what he's doing there, Prince Hamlet, is he is pondering uh, whether to keep living or to willfully die. Because he looks at life and he says, life is so difficult. There's injustice. Uh, there's pain. There's hardship and there's suffering. And yet he's hesitant to end his life because he, he fears that maybe the, the alternative is worse. And so he's going back and forth between life and death. And so he says to himself, to be or not to be, that is the question. And now we have all of this evidence about Jesus Christ from the Gospel of John. We have signs and wonders that point to who he is. We have testimony from Jesus. We, we have words from God through Jesus Christ. And the question is not to be or not to, or to, be, or not to be, but to believe or not to believe. Jesus gives us words and he, he gives us evidence and he gives us signs and he gives us words from God. He preaches the gospel to us. And the question is to believe or not to believe. That is the question of this gospel. Who is Jesus? What did he come to do? And who are you in relation to him? To believe or not to believe? That is the question. And what happens here at the end of chapter 12 in John, at the end of chapter 12, uh, Jesus preaches one last time before moving to the upper room discourse with his disciples. And so this sort of brings uh, this major section of the gospel to a close. And Jesus preaches one last time, and he tells us to believe or not to believe, and he gives us the consequences of both. He will give you the consequences of believing or not believing. And he's also going to explain to us exactly what it means to receive him exactly what it means to believe in him. Now, something strange that happens here is that right before this, it says that Jesus withdrew from them. He hid himself. Remember this? He hid himself from them. And then all of a sudden, strangely, Jesus is back and he's preaching, right? So it's like, well, did he hide himself or did he not hide himself? What you need to understand about this gospel is when you find something like that, John is not uh, giving us a chronological document. He is giving us a theological document. John is not putting things in chronological order. He's putting things in theological order. Does that make sense? I mean, you do this a lot. So you might retell a story or a situation to your spouse or your friend or whatever, and you might actually mix up on chronolo chronologically, like what happened first and what happened second. You're not talking in a chronological way. You're just talking about what happened altogether. And so in the same way, John is sort of using a theological method to say this is the closing declaration from Jesus to the public to say to believe or not to believe. That is the question this morning. So look with me at chapter 12, verse 44. Chapter 12, verse 44. Jesus will challenge us to believe. He will call us to believe. And he will warn us of the consequences of not doing so. Verse 44. And Jesus cried out and said, whoever believes in me, believes not in me, but in him who sent me, that is the Father. And whoever sees me, sees him who sent me, that is the glory of the Father. I have come into the world as light, so that whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness. What Jesus is saying is that he is the Son of God the Father, and that when you look at Jesus, you see in him and in his life and in his words, you see in the Son of God the glory of his Father. When you see what Jesus is like, you are actually seeing what the invisible Father is like. That in Jesus we see God. In Jesus we meet God. In Jesus we relate to God. So to believe in Jesus is also to believe in his Father, for they are one. And Jesus came from him into the world. So the only way, the only way to relate to the Father, the only way to believe in God, truly believe in him, the only way to know the true God is to know and believe in and come to God through Jesus. Jesus is saying, if you want to know me and if you want to believe in me and if you want to understand who God is, you have to know me. You have to believe in me. You have to receive me. You cannot separate believing in God and knowing God from believing in Jesus and knowing Jesus. They are one. And Jesus is the representative of the Father, the agent of the Father, the sent one, and the very Son of God. He is the very Word of God, that he is the expression of God's very perfect nature. 
He is the second person of God, and he has come to show us God, to bring us back to God, to teach us of God. John 1.14 says, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus is the word. The word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. He came, and we have seen his glory. Glory as of the Son of the Father. Colossians 2.9 says this, For in Jesus, in him, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. Jesus declared to us in this gospel over and over, he said, I'm in the Father, and the Father's in me. He says that in John 14. He says, I'm in the Father, and the Father is in me. And he says, even if, even if you don't believe my words, he says, look at my works and see that the Father is in me doing his works. This is central to Christianity. This is central to being a Christian. That, that in John 20, when Jesus says, or when John says, these are written that you might believe he's the Son of God, the Christ, that's a Trinitarian statement off the bat. To believe in Jesus is to believe in a triune God. He's the Son of the Father. He's the Spirit-anointed Messiah, the Spirit, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. If you see me, you see the Father. If you believe in me, you believe in the Father. And then he says in verse 46, I come into the world as light. I was listening to the radio two nights ago. I had the boys, and we went to Costco, as, as we always do. And this new song came on that I hadn't heard by a guy named Larry Fleet. And I kind of like country a little bit. So I like a good old classic country. I don't like this country pop stuff country raps. I don't know what that is. That's like not even music. So if you like that, I'm really sorry. But uh, the funny thing is I like rap. Actually, there's one song that I like that's country rap. I take that back. Uh, Nico Moon. I do like one of his songs. Uh, not the beer part, but the rest of it. Um, I'm just going to, I'm just going to look back at my notes now. Um, <laughs> Larry, back to Larry. Let's go back to Larry. Larry Fleet. He has a song, it's called Where I Find God, and, and it's really a catchy song. I don't know if you've heard it, but uh, go check it out. It's actually kind of really pleasant to sing and listen to, and um, he talks about how when he's like, he even talks about like when I'm on the bar stool or when I'm in creation or like when I hear a cricket chirp uh, or listen to her heartbeat, I think he's talking about his daughter in the video, he's with his little, little baby girl, and he's, he says, that's where I find God. And there's like a measure of truth to this because the Bible says the heavens declare God's glory. Like we see something of God in creation. That's Psalm 19. That's uh, Romans chapter 1, right? So we see and find something of God. God reveals himself through creation. But it made me think about the phrase, where I find God. And I immediately thought to myself, where we find God is not ultimately in creation. It is in the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is saying, if you've seen me, you've seen God. If you find me, you find God. If you believe in me, you believe in God. Where we find God is not ultimately or penultimately in his creation. We find him in the Lord Jesus Christ and his redeeming work. There is no salvation apart from Jesus. There's no knowing God apart from Jesus. There's no believing in God apart from believing in Jesus. Where we find God is in Jesus Christ, incarnate, living as a man, dying in our place, rising from the dead at the right hand of God. That's where you find God. If you see me, Jesus says, you see the Father. And this is what Larry Fleet said. He said, I'm a Christian, so I've been in the Baptist church for a long time. But my thing about it was, you know, I've, I haven't always been in the church, but I always knew deep down there was a God. A lot of people are like that. They don't know, they don't necessarily know what God is or who God is, but they know something's there, and they can go out in nature and see it. I wanted to write to include everybody in this song, and wherever you're at in your faith, anybody can relate to it. See, I wish he had gone to, you find God in Jesus. He just stops with Romans 1. He stops with creation, and he says, people don't know what God is or who God is, and I would say, yes, we do. And we find who God is and we know him in Jesus. That's exactly what Christ is saying. It is not enough for you to have the general revelation of creation. It's not enough for you to just believe that a God exists. There are not multiple paths to God. There's one, and that's in Jesus. We need special revelation. We need particular revelation. We needed the Lord Jesus Christ to come in flesh and speak to us and reveal God to us. And then Jesus says in verse 46, I have come into the world as light, so that whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness. 
may not remain in darkness. Notice something in verse 45. He says, if you see me, you see the Father. He uses this, this verb see, eyes, sight. And then he says, I've come into the world as light so that you might believe in me and not remain in the kingdom of darkness or in darkness. Notice that light and darkness has to do with sight. It's funny because I, I, I had good eyesight till I was about 28 maybe. I got in my 30s and what surprised me about starting to lose my eyesight is not the blurriness, it's the dimness. You know what I'm saying? Like driving at night, for the first time driving at night where I like could not see very well, I was like, this is a problem. This is not cool. Like, like losing your eyesight is not cool. And Jesus says, I've come as light so that you might not remain in darkness. In Colossians, it says the son came to deliver us from the kingdom of darkness and bring us into his own kingdom, to bring us under his rule. His yoke is easy. His burden is light. And the way he brings his kingdom and the way he brings you into his kingdom is through the cross where he made atonement for you. He died uh, taking your punishment. Jesus came to set us free from darkness so that we can see God in Jesus and be saved and believe in him. God has spoken through his son. God has revealed himself through his son. And then secondly, not only do we see that Jesus is the son of the father, that he's the light in darkness, but we see really, uh, we kind of come down to the heartbeat of this text or the center of this text. And here's where I really want to uh, draw out all of our major application from the text. And this is in verse 47 through 50, 47 through 50. He says, if anyone hears my words and does not keep them, my words, I do not judge him. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. The one who rejects me and does not receive my words has a judge. The word that I have spoken will judge him on the last day. For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me has himself given me a commandment, what to say and what to speak. And I know that his commandment is eternal life. What I say, therefore, I say as the Father has told me. As I was reading that, did you catch his emphasis on his words? What I say, what I say, the Father's told me what to say. If you reject me, you reject my words, right? You, you notice this emphasis all throughout that section that he says, if you hear my words and do not keep them. That's verse 47. Verse 48, the one who rejects me and does not receive my words has a judge, the word that I have spoken will judge him on the last day. Verse 49, for I have spoken, on, I have not spoken on my own authority. The Father has told me what to say. Jesus is focused on his words. And here's what he does, if you notice this. He says this in verse 48. He says, if you reject me and do not receive my words, you still have a judge. Jesus connects believing in him with believing his words. There is a direct connection between believing in Jesus by believing his word. That there is no form of, of being a Christian apart from receiving the word about Christ. That this is how you and I relate to God through Jesus. We relate to God through Jesus by believing and receiving and keeping and abiding and holding fast to his word. But see, what happens with someone like Larry Fleet or with the people that listen to his song is they say, I believe in God. I believe. I have faith. But there is no content to their faith. There is no doctrine there is no description of who Jesus is and why he has come and where he came from and what he came to do for us on the cross. Jesus says, if you want to believe in me, you have to believe my word. There is no other kind of faith, Christian faith. And then on the opposite, he says, he warns you. And he says, if you reject my words, you're rejecting me and you're rejecting the Father. The interplay in this text is focused on either receiving the words of Christ or rejecting the words of Christ. Receiving Jesus or rejecting Jesus. And your destiny and your spiritual state is manifested in how you respond to the words of the Lord Jesus Christ and the words of Scripture that testify to him. Your spiritual state and your eternal destiny is declared and manifested through how you relate to the words of Jesus. That is what he, the point he is making. And there are huge consequences at stake. 
huge consequences at stake. First, on the positive side of things, if you receive Jesus by receiving his testimony, there is eternal life. Look at verse 49. For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me has himself given me a commandment, what to say and what to speak. So in other words, the Father has commanded me exactly what he wants me to teach you. Verse 50. And I know that his commandment is eternal life. There it is. His commandment, what he has told me to say, are words of eternal life. They are words of eternal life. That if you believe my words about me being the Son of God, coming as the King, the Messiah, coming from the Father to be crucified and raised for your salvation, if you believe my word, they are words of eternal life for you, not eternal death. Didn't Jesus say this earlier on in John 6? I love this. This is one of my favorite texts in all scripture. Verse 63. John 6, 63. It's the spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The Holy Spirit is the one who gives us life. The flesh is no help. Then he says, the words that I've spoken to you are spirit and life. Notice that. It is the Holy Spirit who breathes out the scriptures. Jesus is speaking by the Holy Spirit. So when we hear the word of Jesus or the word of God in Scripture, we are hearing the voice of the Spirit, and thus those words are spirit and life for us. When received by faith, there is life in the word of God. The word of God performs in your heart exactly what God wants it to do. He gives you life through his word. He gives you new birth through his word. He grows you in holiness through his word. He grows you in relationship through his word. He guides you through his word. He leads you through his word because his words are spirit and life. His words are spirit and life. That means there is no eternal life apart from hearing and receiving the words of life about Jesus. And and it's interesting because In verse 66, if we could look at 66, I love what Peter says. After this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. They they heard some hard teaching and they rejected it. So Jesus said to the 12, do you want to go away as well? (laughs) Simon Peter answered, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Words of eternal life. Amazing. Jesus says, the Father's given me words, and I've spoken them to you. And if you receive those words, they are words of eternal life. But if you reject my word, if you reject the word of Christ and the testimony of the gospel, if you reject the word of Christ crucified, risen, ascended, and King and Messiah, then there is judgment for you. There is only judgment for you. Your destiny and your spiritual state is manifested in how you respond to the words of Jesus Christ and the testimony of the scriptures to him. Jesus says this about judgment. Verse 48. The one who rejects me and does not receive my words has a judge. The word that I have spoken will judge him on the last day. That's a really interesting statement. The elders and I discussed this statement. The word will judge you. Jesus basically says, I came to save the world right now, so so judgment is not right now. Final judgment is not right now. I did not come to judge the world. I came to save the world. Judgment is postponed. Judgment is not now, but if you reject my word and keep rejecting my word and keep rejecting my word, there is a judgment coming at the final day and what will judge you on that day is my word. It is clear from scripture that Jesus is the judge of the world. He's the one appointed by God to judge the living and the dead. And the way he will judge you is by his word. And the way he will judge you is by whether you received or rejected his word. Your rejection of his word will testify against you on the last day. Jesus will look at you and say, I never knew you. You rejected my word, and that is manifested in works of darkness and works of evil because you don't love the truth. You don't love my word. You reject it. You throw it out, and thus you reject me and my Father, and thus your life is full of darkness. The final judgment is based on the word of Jesus. My word will judge you. And so... 
you and I are faced with a decision to believe or not to believe. We, we believe a specific revelation from Jesus. We believe the words of Jesus or we reject the words of Jesus. There is no faith apart from believing his word. These two things cannot be separated. And Jesus says that over and over and over in his text. Now, there are sort of two options with regards to the Christian life. Number one, you could live by the word of Christ, which I would say is true Christianity. True Christianity is by the illumination and the inner working of the Holy Spirit, you hear and receive and believe and abide in the word of Christ. That's biblical Christianity. It's very word-saturated. There is no form of Christianity that is real, that is not word-saturated. In fact, I think the most spirit-filled people are the people who are filled with the word of the Spirit. Who breathed out the word? The Spirit. So how do you get spirit-filled? You are filled with the word of the Spirit. It's very simple. The most spirit-filled Christian is the person who's filled with the word of Christ, trying to abide in that word and hold fast to that word and live out that word. The other option is what I call spiritualism. It's not Christianity, it's spiritualism. Spiritualism, let me explain what I mean, is where the words of Scripture and the words of Christ through Jesus are no longer the center of your faith and your abiding and your walk. What becomes the center of your spiritual experience is just that. It is your experience. It is your mystical experience. It is your subjective thoughts. It is your subjective intuitions and emotions. Everything becomes for you about the subjective, the internal. It is no longer about the external revelation from Christ. And so what happens is you trade the word of God for something that you make more supreme, which is something coming from within you. That is spiritualism. Now, is there a mystical experience in the Christian life? Of course there is. Of course there is. But it is never detached from the word of God and God speaking to you and God revealing himself to you and especially from the scriptures. A, a Bible-less Christianity or, or, or someone who takes the Bible and pushes it aside or decentralizes it or makes it secondary or unimportant is not Christianity at all. Spiritualism rejects the word, pushes the word aside, decentralizes the word for its own subjective, mystical, internal experience. That's what becomes supreme for spiritualism. But Christianity is filled with the word, the word as revealed from God through Christ. I have spiritual, mystical experiences all the time, and I can't fully understand them. God works providentially in my life all the time. He answers prayer all the time. He brings people into my life all the time. We've seen him do it at this church. It's not that the only way God ever communicates through us is through the Bible. That's not the only way he ever communicates. However, it is the primary normative way in which he works because the Spirit is the one who speaks the word. The Spirit is the one who breathed out the scriptures. And so what needs to be supreme in our faith is, is believing in Christ through his word, abiding in him through his word, not through our subjective emotional experiences. Look, your mind, your emotions, your will, your internal person is fallen. It's depraved. It's all touched by sin. But the word of God is not. The word of God is pure, it is perfect, it is unchanging. And so we need to be very careful that we do not decentralize the word of God, that we do not push it aside and we do not reject it. Because that is exactly what spiritualism does, and that is not Christianity at all. A good example of this was during the Protestant Reformation in 1522. These three guys named the Zwickau Prophets show up in the town of Wittenberg. The Zwickau Prophets, I dare you to try to say that seven times in a row. Zwickau Prophets in Wittenberg. Now, Martin Luther is away from Wittenberg. Wittenberg was sort of the center of the Reformation at the time. And, and he's away in hiding, and Frederick the Wise is protecting him. And everything in Wittenberg has been left to his colleagues and his protégés and his successors, and they're just doing a horrible job. Everything's falling apart. There's chaos in Wittenberg. 
they're about to lose the Reformation. They're, it's all about to fall apart. And so Martin Luther has no choice. He hears about this, and they sort of bring him in secretly back to Wittenberg. He had become a knight and grown a beard and kind of hid out in this castle, but now he has no choice. He has to come into Wittenberg to save the Reformation. And he starts preaching the Word of God and preaching the Word of God and preaching the Word of God, and he finds out that there are these three Zwickau prophet guys, and here's what the Zwickau prophets emphasized. They adopted the view that true authority lays in the inner light given to God given by God to his own rather than in scripture. Now their primary authority now is the internal spiritual experience. It is not holy scripture. That's exactly what the Zwickau prophets taught. They believe that teachings came only from the Holy Spirit directly to the inner person and he was in direct opposition to the doctrines of sola scriptura where scripture is primary. Scripture is the norming norm that cannot be normed. One of the three prophets named Munzer Luther, Luther said this about him. He said, Munzer has swallowed the Holy Spirit, feathers and all. I love that. He has swallowed the Holy Spirit, feathers and all. It's not that the work of the Holy Spirit is unimportant. It's that they detach the work of the Spirit from the Word. They made internal subjective experience primary rather than the Word revealed in Scripture. Their authority became the direct leading and inner revelations of the Spirit. They did not need the Bible anymore. Their authority was the inner subjective mystical experience apart from the Word of God. But Christianity has never been that way. Christianity has always been attached to direct revelation through God's Word, whether that's through prophets, whether that's through Christ, whether that's through Scripture. We can't detach these things. A good example of this in God's working is uh, there are about 6 million Muslims per year right now that are converted to Christianity. That's a lot. And actually, that is uh, novel in human history. That's very novel in human history, to have 6 million a year. It has proved very hard for Muslims to be converted. Very hard. Now, here's what's happening. Many of these Muslims are getting dreams and visions about the Christian Jesus. Somehow they know it's the Christian Jesus and not the Muslim Jesus. Don't ask me how. But they get these dreams and visions but here's what happens. In the dream and the vision of Jesus or someone in a white, a white uh, robe or dress or shiny uh, dress, they are sent to either a pastor with the word of God, a church with the word of God, or a center for studying scripture. That is, if Jesus appears to them in a dream and or vision, he sends them to a place where they can hear the word of God. Isn't that amazing? That, that, that Jesus could have spoken something specific about himself in the dream or vision, but instead he directs them to the Holy Scriptures. Isn't that fascinating? Because God works normatively through his word. I believe the dreams and the visions are real. I really do. And yet he sends them to the word. You know, God does this with Peter and Cornelius. Cornelius sees an angel. And the angel says, go fetch Peter who will tell you the truth. He will preach to you the word. So we are people of the word. We are people who are led by the spirit through the word. We are people who are spirit filled through the word. When the Bible says you're filled with the spirit and led by the spirit, that is primarily and normatively through the word. Do not, church, if I can say anything, do not separate your spiritual experience from the word. It is a dangerous thing to do. It is a dangerous thing to do. Do not decentralize the word. Do not make something else more primary than the word because that is what heretics eventually end up doing when they say, I don't need the Bible anymore. I don't need the Bible anymore. That is what a heretic does. And so, judgment also comes through the word. Life comes through receiving the word. Judgment comes through re re rejecting the word. And true faith and discipleship is word saturated. You will have mystical, spiritual, subjective experiences. But never, ever detach that from the word. Because it could just be your enchiladas. It could be. It could be. I'm not saying it is, but it could be. How will you know that it's God if it's coming from within you? How will you know? And so we have verses like, do not despise prophecy, but test it. 
We do not want to be a church who despises instant direct revelation if God gives it, but we must test it. We must approve it. And we do that in community. We do not do that alone. We are not Zwickau prophets. We are Christians. We are people of the word, the word of the spirit. Let's pray. Our Father, we come to your word and Jesus emphasizes his word from you. We need to be people of the word, the spirit-filled word. And yes, you do move in our lives apart from the book. You do test us and approve us through suffering. You do bring about provident circumstances and you do communicate in your own way through those things. And yet, Lord, we must hold fast to the word for the Christian life is believing in Jesus by believing his word. Help us to do that. Give us faith to do that. Strengthen us to do that. Let us not make our own inner man supreme. Let us make the word supreme for the word reveals Christ. We know that the Holy Spirit wants us to look to Christ, not to ourselves. Lord, you tell us that you give new birth through the word. You tell us that you sanctify us through the word. And so we ask you to do that. Oh God, ever keep us from ever decentralizing your word and making ourselves supreme. Help us to test and approve everything underneath your authority. Lord, we do pray that we would experience the fullness of your power and grace in our lives. And Lord, help us to trust and obey the revelation that we have. For if we can't trust and obey the revelation you've given us, why would you give us further? You are faithful and we are not. You are true and we are not. You are sufficient and we are not. You are gracious even when we are not. We trust you. We praise you. We worship you. Lord, strengthen our faith through the taking of the supper. This mystical experience that is connected to the word, the word of the gospel. We pray we'd experience renewal through it. In Christ's name, amen.